Welcome to Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective podcast, where we meet experts from all walks of life to learn their intrinsic motivation so that they can share it with the world. What do we have in store today? Stay tuned to find out more. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. You are in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I am David. And today we are blessed to speak with a wonderful person who has over 30 years of volunteering and working in mental health. If you've listened to our recent podcast, mental health seems to be a hot topic which used to be put in the back burner. So now uh, we have a CEO of a podcast network that is dedicated to mental health. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Kristen Walker to the podcast. Welcome, Kristen. Hi, gentlemen. Thank you so much for inviting me on. It's my pleasure. Yeah, we're glad to have you. Now, I wanted to ask you before we get into pedigrees and all that there – what I've heard or what I've learned is from uh, a term called seeding. And what that seeding is, is if I've never bought a BMW before, the minute I buy it, I see it everywhere. (laughs) Okay. So from us, we're seeing a lot of mental health awareness or just um, the topic of it in recent months. But for someone that lives and breathes this, is that the case? Is there an uptick? Or what are you seeing on your side? Well, (laughs) is there an uptick? It's hard to, this is a chicken and egg thing maybe, it's hard to say because I am so steeped in it. I feel like it's much um, more prevalent that we can talk about these things, but then I'm not the greatest you know, I am in this field in every way possible. The way that I, the only way that I can effectively um, notice it is conversations I have outside of the field, which are very rare, <laughs> and how not as uncomfortable people are with things that come out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I don't get the be quiet, look down, they've stopped talking, they're uncomfortable. I don't get that quite as much as I did before. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's back. Let's go all the way back then because typically people go to school for business or law or teaching and you got into mental health and you, you've been in it for over 30 years, so... What sparked the interest? Well, um, I want to, you know, put this out there. My pedigree, depending on what, you know, you guys deem as pedigree, is probably very short for uh, up against or along with guests that I have on my show. I don't have a degree in anything. Zero. I I, um, tested out of high school early. Um, to go work full time, and all of my experience in mental health, mental health has been as two things: a volunteer, and as a patient of mental health services. So that's, um, and that, and then also um, working in the technology field, supporting mental health organizations. So that's my experience. I don't come at this from a clinician um, or you know, neuroscientist or anything like that kind of a standpoint. I'm always advocating on behalf of the patient that's receiving services and trying to make people aware that everybody could benefit from mental health um, services and that they're no different. It's no different and no less important than your physical health, your brain health, your bunion health, you know. So that's that's my quote-unquote pedigree. <laughs> So kind of like an on the type. It sounds like what? I'm sorry, I missed that. I was saying it sounds like it was just kind of like an on-the-job type training. Oh, my gosh, yes, yeah. And that's how I learn, and I do have an extensive uh, 
childhood with um, trauma, and um, I've been very vocal and outspoken about it at a very young age. I'm used to making people feel uncomfortable, <laughs> so, um, and that's okay. I took that on, and that's okay because it got conversations going, and I was talking about things like sexual abuse when I was 13, 14, 15, 16, and doing speeches about it in front of clinicians and ER doctors and so on. So the landscape in terms of um, people receiving the information has way changed. I used to get pointed at, called out, how dare you say this about your family, blah, 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 um, or just people not understanding what I'm saying, doctors and so on that are trying to ask me, well, how do you tell if someone has experienced trauma? And that has completely changed. I can't see that those conversations um, would necessarily happen the way that they did in today's landscape with the knowledge we have out there. But, you know, when I was, I'm 48, so when I was talking about this stuff, we're talking 1983. You did not talk about things like sexual abuse in 1983. <laughs> Yeah, I think what you said as far as, uh, well, and again, with regards to pedigree, I think sometimes it's better that someone is listening to or has access to an advocate, you know, that yeah. way you're more on the ground floor, ground level, and it's like, oh, I can totally relate, as opposed to, uh, like you said, buttoning up and, and, and not being as forthcoming with information when they speak to a, prof uh, you know, a, a doctor or so forth. Yes, absolutely. And honestly, you know, people have said, you should be a life coach. You should go to school finally. And I'm like, well, I can, I can can the network if I'm going to go to school now because I don't have time. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I've done really well without that. Not that I, you know, I mean, many, most of my friends have advanced degrees. So it's not like I put that down at all. It's just that um, I want to be able to have the conversation and me being an advocate, without the licensure allows me to speak freely. And that's important to me. If I was a clinician, and I've actually had um, counselors say, you're way too personal on your show, and I have to remind them, I'm not a therapist. I don't have to, you know, not share the way that you have to not share. And then they go, oh, right, I'm sorry, you're right, you know, it takes a minute, because I know so much, and I'm around therapists all the time, they, it's a compliment that they think I'm a colleague, and the reality is, I'm not, I'm, I'm really not a colleague, um, I'm, maybe on the business side, I can be, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm on a, I'm in a different space than they are, so I can say whatever I want. <laughs> I love it, no, yeah. censor, no censorship at all. Exactly, and that's the point. I mean, mental health should not have censorship. It's your mental health. <laughs> what part of that are you not getting? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm always like, let's get back to the basics. <laughs> well, when you think of mental health, I mean, it's such a big umbrella, and there's so much under it. So if you can kind of walk us through of, of what you're seeing as to uh, I hate to say the most popular thing, but, yeah. you know, what do you see as far as uh, disorders that, uh, again, seems to be on an uptick because, you know, we're, we are having this um, opioid war, if you will, and, and right. uh, substance abuse or workplace or, you know, the Me Too that's happening out there. I mean, some of it all could be attributed to mental health. Oh my goodness, all, everything, to me, everything contributes to it and is a part of it because you, you can't be, a, unless you're in a coma, well, even in a coma, your mental health is important, so it's always there, okay? It's like physical health, it's always there. But um, in terms of topics that are trending and things I get asked to speak about on news shows and stuff like that are... Um, definitely the Me Too movement, um, narcissism, that's huge, and um, you know, our personality disorders are huge always. Those are the shows that we get the most downloads about. Um, and then uh, trauma, because things like a personality disorder are born um, most likely of trauma, and then you have the people that are become victims of people with personality disorders and 
um, many times someone who becomes a victim of that kind of um, behavior from someone is someone who also has experienced severe trauma. So those are really, that and things like bipolar disorder, uh, that's more popular to talk about because it's becoming less stigmatized. It's always been here, always been here, mm -hmm. but um, it's less talked about. And then how those things like incorrectly diagnosed um, things like bipolar disorder and so on will lead people into addiction because they haven't been properly diagnosed and treated and so they've been coping by themselves and they turn to substance use in order to manage that pain rather than, you know, having hit it early on and got, you know, into the right mode of treatment. So those are, those are what's trending. Hmm. Kristen, let me ask you this. This is just out of curiosity. What's the difference between personality disorder and bipolar disorder? Well, um, bipolar disorder, oh, and I remember I'm not a clinician, so forgive me to any, any counselor that's listening in. Um, <clears throat> what I have learned from guests is that uh, bipolar disorder um, can be genetic and it's a chemical imbalance. There are things not firing in the brain um, the right way and it's and that it's also treatable with medication and therapy. Personality disorders, there's a lot of disagreement around them being a chemical imbalance. There definitely is gray matter in different areas of the brain. When you look at a pro-social psychopath like Dr. Jim Fallon, or you look at, you know, someone that doesn't have a, um, you know, that that brain, but not chemical like bipolar. Um, mm. Not that's the piece that seems to be different, and also personality disorders. Many people are of the belief that those are really untreatable. They're they can be managed, but the person with the personality disorder part of the disorder is they absolutely know that they don't have a problem it's not that they believe that they don't have a problem it's that they emphatically know they don't have a problem and so how do you treat that yeah. and there's disagreements about that but that that would be the the two main differences mm -hmm. okay uh, yeah I think when, when you talk about that that uh, especially with the personality disorder you know, you always hear after the fact that they had gotten off of their treatment, right? So they were just like, I never really felt right when I was on it, and now I'm off, and I've been off for a couple, I don't know, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, and they have an episode. You know, so. Are you talking about bipolar, or are you talking about personality disorders? Um, I think it's probably a combination of both. I know that uh, more so personality disorder because if you felt like if in your definition you said that they don't feel they have a an issue so you know they may do a lot of self-treatment or when they get help they don't feel that the, it, it's long term well the way I would look at that is because it to me that sounds more like bipolar disorder what happens with that is people start to feel good because they're taking their medication and so they think, oh, I don't need, I feel so good, I don't need this anymore. And they don't attribute the fact that they feel better and they feel like themselves finally. They don't attribute that necessarily to the medication. And so they'll go off of it and then they crash. Um, so that happens a lot with things like bipolar disorder. With a personality disorder, I've never heard ever a clinician, a counselor, neuroscientist, whatever, say that medication helped personality disorders. I've never heard those two things put in the same sentence. Hmm. No, thank, thanks for that clarification. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I have heard them go to count. It's almost like the, the um, or it is like the grist of the meal for someone with let's say narcissistic personality disorder is to cause as much chaos and drama as possible in other people's lives because they get off on um, gaslighting people, um, just to, you know, giving them an alternate reality that is that is complete fiction. Uh, they get off on the hurting of other people, and bipolar disorder does not 
they people with that do not get off on hurting people. They actually feel horrible when they've hurt people. Personality disorders get off on it. Does that make sense? Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Now, when I uh, – I'm in marketing, so, you know, we're always looking at spend and how do I spend this, right? So uh, – or have a positive picture. And right. when you talk disorder, disorder – now, sometimes I think that's where you're getting people that may shut down. And and what I've seen in, re- in recent months is the talk of anxiety. And, you know, you uh, I think it was Ryan Reynolds who's just recently come out and said he, he continuously has pan- panic attacks. Um, the Rock, the same deal. And uh, Mariah Carey actually came out and said she had bipolar disorder. But yep. do you think that they're all rooted in anxiety or anxiety is a symptom? I think anxiety is a symptom. Um, I think, you know, you can certainly be genetically predisposed um, from what I have heard that to things like anxiety, if it runs in your family, um, but also that can be learned if that's how, if it, if you didn't have um, modeling on how to handle it, it can be in a chemical imbalance. There can be other things, but to me the anxiety is sort of uh, the symptom of, something that's happened either bio you know within your body chemically or something related to trauma that happened to you Um, and then anxiety is what blasts out you know as part of how you are coping with either of those things or both of those things at the same time Kristen how how did it come about that you decided to create a a mental health network, you know, radio <laughs> show and podcast? Uh, because I somehow thought that starting another startup at the age of 47 was a good idea. <laughs> You're an entrepreneur. We love it. And yeah. I'm like, okay, this is my sixth. And every single one of them takes more money than you realized and more time and, you know, wake up, like, stop. This is it. And I feel like I may be involved in other things, but this is my passion. It's taken me all this time to figure out this is what I want to do. And I I actually created the network out of guests on my show coming to me and saying, hey, we want a podcast. We have no idea how to do it. You know what you're doing. And I would go, I do. Um, if will you create a network? And my first response, so we started the network um, in 2017, February of 2017. And I was, my first response when I was asked this was, are you kidding? No, I have a full-time gig as a consultant in technology and mental health. I don't want to deal with this. No, I, I, no, it's not going to happen. But they would not give up. And so I created the network and I thought, okay, if I have five shows in production by August of 2017, that's, or I'm sorry, by the end of 2017, that's a good marker of success. And by August, I remember we started in February, so by August of the same year, we had 18 shows. Wow. And now we have between 50 to 70, I haven't taken a look, uh, that are in the queue wanting to get started. And it started out as individual podcasters coming to us, advocates. And now it's expanded into behavioral health organizations, um, conference venues and mental health, um, places like uh, McLean Hospital in Boston, which is a huge, world-renowned Harvard Medical School affiliate, you know, all these things that in psychiatry and psychology and um, they're having us produce a podcast for them. So I think my business knowledge helped me go after the right places and then the advocacy and the heart behind it is what helps me um, get people to be invested in the mission of this because no one joins that doesn't have the heart of an advocate. No one. It's just not possible. This network is all about like getting as many voices out there as possible. It's, um, you know, financial compensation is wonderful and that's an important part of life, but that comes behind the advocacy. Mm. 
what were yeah. who, what were your other baby your other projects before the network? <laughs> well, I was doing really well um, in um, technology consulting on um, software and mental health, so. I still get asked to do that every so often, but I, I only do it if it's a huge project. Um, and helping vendors that have mental health software. And before that, I was in the CRM. I, you probably know from marketing what a CRM is, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So I was an ACT certified consultant probably before y'all's time, but I was a Salesforce.com consultant um, with my own company and Sugar CRM and you know blah 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 blah. And uh, <laughs> that's what I did. I would go into organizations like mental health organizations, and I would work on their uh, or you know big healthcare organizations. Dell was a client at one point. I would go in and look at what kind of database they were using to track their marketing and sales efforts, and then we would build a custom solution using a CRM platform to you know, make it go fast for them. And I did that for a long, a long time and had multiple companies doing that kind of work before I went in and went, you know what, I love volunteering in mental health, and so why don't I take what I love as a volunteer and put it to use in terms of business because if counselors, doctors, people that service this industry don't have the right tools, then they cannot do their jobs well and patients suffer. So that was the reasoning by getting, by switching and going into this profession full time. And then that turned into, well, let's podcast about, about this whole topic. Do you have the first iPhone or the first iPod, or do you even use an iPod anymore? <laughs> I don't. I'm an Android person. I know that's horrible, um, but I, I am an Android person. But I did have the very first Palm Pilot. Oh, wow. <laughs> 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 well, that hasn't even a while. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I had the very first BlackBerry. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now we're talking. <laughs> well, I, I only bring it up because, you know, Steve, and, and I'm team Android too, but the reason why I brought it up is because Steve Jobs, and, and I love him for saying this, he was always saying that he he doesn't see failure, he sees that he's uh, failing forward, you know, yeah. and, and if he didn't, we, we would still be walking around with the first iPod, and so when you're like, oh, I'm going to do one one more time. You're like, no, all of your experiences gave you what you needed to start this. Yeah, absolutely. It's so cool to get to that place. And it can happen at 22. It can happen at 47. It can happen at 72. You know, it, when it happens, it's wonderful no matter what age you are. And sometimes it's a consistent happening of deeper knowledge. Um, but it's, it's really nice when you get to that place where you go, okay, so those weren't mistakes. Those were missteps. Mm -hmm. And everything that I've done now is starting to make sense. So those, you know, even down to those jobs that I took where I was bullied, me of all people stands up and, you know, confronts sexual abusers. And here I am, you know, being bullied in my 40s in a workplace environment by a sadistic um, personality disordered human being, um, all of those things played a role into what I'm doing today because had I not had, let's say, that experience with this person, I would have never done my podcast. I was so angry and upset and like what happened that it made me speak out again, get back into being that advocate that I had kind of pushed to the side because I was busy working and having a family and all that stuff. So even those painful situations I can look at and go, oh, that's why that happened. Got it. Got it. All makes sense. We always say that there's no accident. And yeah. so, you know, there is a school of thought that once you transition, you know, you're looking to see, you know, mom, dad, and, and other people, but your best friends will be the person that really got under your skin in this life. <laughs> yeah, and I have a spiritual um, advisor that I work with who always says, you know, you know you signed up for that, right, with that person, and they signed up for that with you. 
so that you could both be propelled into the next growth path. And I'm like, whatever. I don't want to hear that today. I'm just mad. Okay. I'll be benevolent tomorrow, but today, no. (laughs) Well, the reason why I also like it is because, you know, not blowing smoke, but you are in, in in a sense a beacon because of being such an advocate in the field of technology that is usually male driven. So you're running yes. across a lot of energy where women are coming across narcissistic behavior. Yes, very true. It's so funny. I, I was interviewed by somebody, I don't remember who it was, but it was um, on a news show and they were like, well, have you ever experienced, you know, that kind of behavior? And I said, well, I know you don't have my bio, but I ran a tech company for over a decade and I'm and I'm a woman. So, what do you think? <laughs> Not exactly a lot of comp. I, I'm always with men. Even today, I have most of the podcasters on my network are men. I don't. It's not. I mean, there are women too. But I think because I, I'm so comfortable working with men, and I've worked out so many issues related to working with men, and I know how to weed out very quickly, okay, this one ain't going to work, so I'm just going to go and work with this person. It's really quick. There's a you know very quick sign language now about it that, um, that I don't necessarily have as much of with women because women were not my peers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was going in and consulting with Ross Perot, you know, his company before he sold it to Dell. And that was, those were my mentors because there just weren't women around when I was being a CEO. So um, I look forward to having more women, um, you know, around as colleagues now, but uh, it's very different men and women. I don't care what people say. There is a, you know, there's definitely a difference. Women aren't used to being on top. So we don't, we're not as comfortable there as, as men are. And um, that plays out differently in, in how we can behave. So I'm grateful, man, am I grateful that I got to be in tech as a female at the time that I did because um, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about how to um, get ahead even when the entire deck is stacked against you oh. without being a you know, a jerk. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm. That's a good point because you're, you're saying that, you know, there is another school of thought, right? That you have to wear the pantsuit and actually take on those personalities to get ahead. And it sounds like you actually totally were successful, even though you were bucking the system. Yeah. I've always been like, you know, just like now here I am working in mental health. I'm interviewing the, you know, so much, uh, pedigree and they will and they and they ask for me to interview them and uh, and yet I don't even have a degree so I'm that's just kind of me and the way that I am and uh, I do it without I've learned from the people that do have serious personality disorders that are successful because they can be extremely singularly focused um, that I don't what I don't want to be I, I want a welcoming, inclusive environment uh, where people can help as many people as possible. And if I, you know, invited personality disordered people into that, it would put a monkey wrench right into our um, into our healing environment because their goal is not necessarily to heal, and that's what ours is. <laughs> yeah. Kristen, can you talk a little bit about um, animal-assisted therapy? Sure, sure. Um, I started doing that, um, gosh, many years ago. I mean, at least eight or nine years ago, maybe longer. And I, I... love dogs. I've always just had the thing with dogs. Cats want me to die, but dogs really, um, and I think that they come from the, from hell, but, um, dogs are wonderful (laughs) and, um, and they are receivers. They just receive dogs and horses or, you know, the, they're these great receivers. And so 
what I found, yet another way that I got in sideways, was I really wanted to work with mental health patients, and no one was going to let me go and do that because I don't have a degree. And um, But I can walk in with a registered therapy dog and work with an entire group of psych patients in a lockdown unit, and I'm welcome to the floor. And um, I can do that, you know, as much as I want because I have this wonderful, furry, <laughs> lovable animal with me. So it's been a great way to, to see um, things from that view, from how the how the – uh, providers handle care and what they're using to handle care in terms of their technology and where they're pulling their hair out and also see how the patients are being treated, meaning me and along with the patients. I'm not saying um, patients as if there are other people, but and also be able to sit there and go, okay, yes, I'm here with my dog and I'm supposed to be the therapy dog person and I'm wondering if they have a bed for me. And could I keep my dog when I check in here? And working, being able to go through, you know, a session and be like, ah, I'm in an anxiety attack right now, and I've got to just get through it. And everybody there understands because they're going, they're there for that reason also. <laughs> so the whole thing, the dog is just bringing a common effect to the environment. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I have actually gone on big technology installs and brought a therapy dog with me for the day of implementation. I've been asked to come into a conference room where counselors are angry at the state regulation person that's talking about what they have to do, yet another thing they have to do to do their job, and they've asked me to come in and bring my dog because immediately everybody calms down. Mm. And... I think the biggest part of that is they bring so much joy because they just are about love. I mean, the you know, the, a dog that's designed to do this kind of work, they're just about love. All they, they just want to give and they don't see your, your flaws like we do. They just are there to help, you know, anyone with their healing. So the best thing ever is to get a whole bunch of counselors on the floor in a circle telling them, we'll give you the sticky roll thing for your pants later because you are going to be furry after we go through this exercise and give them the patient experience by making them throw a ball to my dog or pass a ball around and watch my dog with that's a border collie, give them the border collie stare and, and then have them laughing and shouting. And then I go, okay, now any of you that were, Um, non-believers about animal-assisted therapy helping people with mental health, how do you feel right now? Do you feel really good? And they're like, okay, we get it. Yes, we feel good. And the thing is, someone that's steeped in their trauma, their mental health issues, all of that, if you prove to them that feeling good is possible, even if it's for a minute, you've helped them realize that it's possible for longer than that amount of time. And if a dog is a facilitator of making that happen, fantastic. Yeah. What type of cigarettes does your lassie smoke? (laughs) What type of cigarettes? (laughs) Yeah, because dogs usually take on a lot of energy from the people they're around. And so how do they detox? Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Um, well, I kept him short. I mean, and Miles is, uh, he was done after 45 minutes. Like that, that was it. And I just made sure that we left and we only did it once he got older. We did it once a week. He used to be able to do it um, a couple times a week working with kids and, in behavioral health classrooms and um, working with adults. So, we just kept the time short because I, it's a load. It's a, it's an, a, a load. And also my nature is, and some people that I've come up against would totally say that I'm full of it, but my nature tends to be kind of calm energy. And um, my dogs are a reflection of, of that energy. They're, your dog is a reflection of, of its owner typically. And so the fact that we have four Border Collies that don't chew, they don't really bark, they listen, they lay down and take naps and sleep um, when they're border collies <laughs> is, um, is a reflection of, you know, kind of the 
the chill that they're around with the, their owners. You sound like the dog whisperer. He always, that's what he always says. He always says that the dogs are a reflection of their owners. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I mean, I've even had, I had a wonderful therapist whose dogs were a nightmare. And when you walked into her house, they would start biting your fingertips and jumping and barking. And I would sit down waiting for her patient to leave. And, you know, and she would walk out and her dogs would do that for a minute. But and I never told them no, or I just, my body language was, I just didn't invest any energy into the bad behavior. I didn't even acknowledge them. And I wasn't trying to do that. That's just how I am. Um, I didn't acknowledge them until they were calm. Yeah. And she would walk out and they'd all be laying on the floor at my feet. And she'd be like, what is it that you do? Yesterday, they jumped out of my car on the freeway. What is it that you do to them? Did you bring a drug? And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's you. It's you. You got stuff that you need to work out, and your animals are here to help you get to the root of it, but you aren't looking at it. And so there's your mirror right there in the, in the form of a furry, fuzzy creature. Do you partner with, with uh, local dog centers, uh, because I'm just seeing a lot of new, re- not new research, research, but recent research with dogs helping, you know, all, all of our veterans coming back with PTSD yeah. and other mental disorders. I don't. Um, <laughs> I don't do that because um, people will often think I'm a dog trainer, and I'm not. Um, I, yeah, I'm not a dog trainer. I'm, I'm good with dogs, and I'm especially good with my dogs. But, I mean, I'm doing this other stuff. So I never got into that aspect of it. But I will get asked to come out and speak about animal-assisted therapy and do a demonstration and also um, come out and, and talk about it uh, at, at an organization. But when they start asking me, can you train my dog, I'm like, that's Cesar Milan and you need to watch his show. <laughs> <laughs> Because I can't say that a Rottweiler that's got severe issues wouldn't also attack me. So I don't have his skill set, uh, and that's because that's what he wants to do. I could if I wanted to do that, because I think I have a natural ability for it. But it's not; it doesn't appeal to me to um, to do that. It's um, this is what appeals to me. So, and we actually have a show now on the network called um, The Animal Effect, and it has a um, social worker, Adam, uh, who is uh, the host of the show, and it hasn't started yet, but he will be this year, and he'll be talking about, he does um, grief and loss therapy around losing your pets, and um, he does all kinds of amazing work in the field, so I can't talk about everything anymore <laughs> because I don't have time, so it's wonderful to have this network and be like, ah, Adam, please interview these amazing people. <laughs> Yeah. I wanted to ask you that about silos, and I guess it's probably more of a propeller head talk, but since you're a technology person, I think you'd appreciate it. Oh, I love it. propeller I'm heads, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I'm so surprised you know what that is, to be honest. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, did, I had to do a Google. No, I know about it. I didn't have to do a Google search. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I heard clicking while we were talking, but no, it, wasn't it. it looks ancient. Oh, that must be old. Yeah. <laughs> it was my dog. My dog was searching for it. <laughs> so, right. Let me ask you, uh, from a technology standpoint, you ha- um, if we go back about you know 20 years or so, you had uh, you know we had this huge dot com boom and bust, yeah. you know, but it, it just introduced so many people to like Google and and iTunes and all that. And at the time, it was you know we can't be evil and we're all family, kumbaya, let's hold hands. <laughs> but then they, be, they they grew up and they became silos and they yeah. want to keep you on their platform. And with your with your uh, podcast network, it seems like it, it's a good silo because for someone that's looking specifically for mental health, they have so much access in, as opposed to the mass podcast, pla- you know, yeah. uh, 
Flatmosphere, if you will. <laughs> uh, so, podcast, I like that. Flatmosphere. Flatmosphere. Yeah. That should be a show. That should be its own show. Flatmosphere. And it's about yeah. technology and mental health. I love that. Um, yeah. <laughs> do you, you guys want to host that? another show? No. Um, do I see that? That's how these things happen. <laughs> That's do right. You, Every. Do I see that? Yes, I do. I think that it was. Um, <laughs> It was a it was a brilliant idea. I'm not going to brag about oh it was well executed because that remains to be seen with what I'm doing. But I think that it helped that I had all this business experience, and I mean, I was in and out of so many. I was a consultant, so I had 300 clients before the recession. Um, I was in and out of so many businesses, working with CEOs. So I got all this knowledge about how you run a business well and how you don't and how do you deal with staff well and how you, you know just all this stuff and how technology plays a role in all of it and so um when i thought okay we're going to do this podcast network about mental health there was half of me saying no one cares this is going to fail epically but do it anyway and then there was a part of me that was like you know what this could possibly be a brilliant thing because look at what's happened. Mental health is now, I started this whole venture and have all this content and did a podcast before they were popular. And now all of a sudden mental health and podcasting are the hip things and I'm way ahead of the game there. So Mm -hmm. it could be brilliant or it could be redonkulous. Who knows? But I feel like it was a good, a good move. And the business stuff that I learned is what helped me go, Oh, that smells good. I'm going to go in that direction. Yeah, I think that just from my feedback, I think that's what I like about your site because I, it, it is in certain areas of mental health that I can actually kind of drill deep. And when yeah. you, right? And, and you were saying that with you, your experience, you run into more men. And for women, mm-hmm. that may grow if they say, oh, okay, but if I go down this lane, this is women centric and then they'll probably be more open. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think mental health, you know, it, it's the wonderful thing about it is that it doesn't matter what your sex is. It doesn't matter what your religious belief. It doesn't matter what your um, sexual preference is. It doesn't matter if you come from Mars. I mean, it's, You know, and if there is a Martian that wants to be interviewed about mental health, you're so welcome on my show. But um, it's it's wonderfully inclusive and it's welcome to men to come and be vulnerable, which is not necessarily a strong suit that men are known for. And it's welcome for women to be encouraged in their vulnerability that they do have more comfort with. So it's it's just a nice space for everybody to feel welcome and um, get in touch with themselves and be in a safe environment to do so. Mm. And I, I don't, I shows come to me, I can have an idea about a show and oh, I, want, I think I want to add one that's about financial things to do with mental health and so on. But I don't go actively seeking that out. It always comes to me, just like I, I didn't ever think of monetizing my podcast. I never thought of doing a network. Those things showed up at my doorstep and uh, sponsors came to me and said, can we do commercials on your show and pay you? And I was like, what is this? This is freaking awesome. Um, so it's, it's the most organic thing that I've ever been a part of. And most of the reason why it's, Uh, been able to grow, I think, is because I just have learned how to get the heck out of my own way, you know? I mean, really, like, there are dust in the corners of my website, and that's okay. It's really okay. Yeah. Yeah. Kristen, I wanted to ask you, um, this is in regards to addiction, and Mm -hmm. I knew I know someone that's been struggling with addiction for the past 25 years, give or take, and um, he went through a stretch of like five years where he was fine, 
right, clean and whatnot. And then he had a big event that was getting ready to come up, kind of like a reunion type thing in yeah. another state that he was getting ready to go to. And just right before that, he just crashed and burned. And yeah. I was having a conversation with a cousin of mine who used to have some addiction problems, but he's gotten his life together. And he told me, he's like, you know what? I'm not surprised at all. That always happens for a lot of addicts, right? Who sort of something big in their life is about to happen. Bam, they crash and burn. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah, because I've done it myself. So I was just uh, wanted to ask you about that. Have you seen a lot of that? Oh, gosh, yes. And it's not just, you know, people that have substance use disorders. It's, you know, that's that's called self-sabotage in one respect. Um, a lot of it can do with, you know, your self-esteem and, and also just your boat being rocked because part of the life of um, sobriety for people that struggle with substance use disorders is maintaining order, maintaining you know, we don't drink every day, we go to meetings. I mean, that's not every ex- person's experience, but that's, a lot of it is about maintaining this emotional centeredness and uh, in order to live this peaceful life where you don't, um, you know, go seek out substances and so on. And then you have something like a big event come up and all the fears and stuff that you've had about yourself, do you deserve this? Uh, it's kind of, you know, derails you like it does anyone and your go-to place is where it was in the past, which is to a substance. Um, oh. And that that's where you seek out relief from or to hide out in. Um, and also it can be chemical too, where your body is still, um, you know, chemically predisposed to wanting a substance. So there's a lot that goes into it but um, that makes absolute sense. And people that aren't addicted to substances do that too. They just do it in different ways. Um, yeah, because that completely blew me away when, like, like I said, everything was going good for this a five-year stretch and then right before this big thing, it just cracked. I'm like, yeah. wow, how does that oh, happen? That's, <laughs> and that's something I think that we, you know, as an industry, we need to pay more attention to. And people that are in the industry do pay attention to it, but people need to know that outside of Uh, behavioral health and mental health because um, the support that someone can get to help them not reach out for substances or that if they do, they're not on, they're not there very long, comes with awareness of the people around them, their support system knowing, ah, there's an event that's coming up. This may just be a trigger for this person And so I'm going to provide extra support and be around them more and not be shame inducing and all of that to support them to know that they can get through this without going to their go-to place or that if they do go to their go-to place, that I'm going to be there to catch them um, so that they don't stay there very long. Yeah. Wow. You know, all of it is about knowledge and awareness. When people know better, they tend to do better. So I think that's why things like mental health and substance use are so are such trending topics. It's not because it's new, it's because it's always been there and we're just in a safer place to have these discussions. Um, yeah. yeah, and and really um, get out of our shame and all those all these stereotypes and I mean you know, look at the Me Too stuff that's going on. Yeah. We couldn't if I had had that work experience that I had now, I would have named names and I would have felt okay about doing so, but it happened before this. And so I talked all about it on my podcast and was just shy of outing the person that's done this to me and many, many women. Um, you know, I, I would have been, I would have felt like, oh, I'll be supported in, in talking about this where at the time I was not supported and mostly by the women that I was working with. Mm-hmm. So uh, that was that was really difficult. It was like, wow, are you kidding? He does this to you too, but you're saying that this is my fault How, and, you're, and you're believing him? Like, are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. So um, it's it's a wonderful thing to have awareness and have 
people uh, feel like I can step forward. And then we have to wade through some of the stuff where people are unfairly attacked and, you know, all that. We've got to wade through that now. But that pendulum will swing back and our new normal will be that that kind of stuff just isn't even part of our consciousness anymore because we worked through it. Mm -hmm. So I I just gave you an example of a story of someone that I knew that had been, you know, clean for five years in the 30 Mm -hmm. years that you've been kind of involved in all this have What's the longest you've ever seen anyone be, you know, clean or, and, and then they kind of fell off the wagon? Oh, I've seen people, you know, known people that have been, uh, you know, without substance usage for decades. Uh, You know, that maybe they, they uh, accepted a sobriety lifestyle in their 20s and then in their 70s when many of their friends are, passing away and they are suffering a huge amount of loss in their lives uh, that they don't know how to process or there's not adequate support for them and then they start drinking again in their 70s after obviously a long time of of living a sober life so it's you know that that happens it just like someone who um, self-sabotages with sexual, you know, acting out can be married and they don't do that and they have 30 years and blah, 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 and then they get divorced and all of a sudden, boom, that was their go-to place and now they're acting out again. So it's part of the human condition, really. It really is. And I think that people that are um, struggle with addiction are just get such a bad rap. They're so stigmatized. Um, It's like they're, you know, they're purposely trying to be awful. <laughs> that is not the case oh, most yeah. of the, you know, most of the time, if at all. Uh, it's you know, that lack of understanding, and then you add shame on top of it. And boy, who wants to speak up and say, "I'm an addict," when in that kind of an environment? Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Do you um, watch or have you heard of the TV show Elementary? Yes, I haven't. I think I've watched one episode, but remind me of the premise of it. Yeah, it kind of goes to what you and David were talking about with substance abuse. So it's a it's a cop show, uh, elementary, Holmes and Watson type of deal. Okay, and yes. He, you know, so he has these smarts, he's working with the police, he's busting people, but he keeps having these bouts with uh, with, with heroin. And, you're, and mm. so I think it's addressing the stigma, like you said, that it may... Uh, the association with abuse is probably, you know, one section of society and it's like, no, it's all walks of life, all walks of life that people are affected. Listen, I just interviewed these two amazing men uh, that are firefighters. One's a captain and I think actually maybe they're both captains in San Diego, California, and they talked about um, their mental health struggles and uh, addiction struggles that they see and I thought it was so fascinating to hear them share their story and talk about, you know what, you know why it's now being taken seriously? Because it's happening everywhere. It's because it's in now affluent neighborhoods. It's mm-hmm. not just in the bad neighborhood. It's everywhere. Like we used to go on calls and we knew that if this part of town was where something was happening, we knew how to prepare for that and now it's it doesn't matter where it is it could be in Bel Air or it could be in Compton and the situation could be horrible in either place so now we just have to be on guard it's not in Bel Air oh someone got a kitten stuck in a tree no it's a mother of three has OD'd and I don't even I won't even say what happened to the baby she was holding I mean it's horrible and so it's the whole idea of oh, it's only in bad neighborhoods is ridiculous. And most of this was created out of pushing pain medication on people and then taking it away in the wrong way. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we created a bunch of people addicted, my ex-husband being one of them. I mean, he was thrown um, pain medication because he was captain of football and hockey and blah, 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 blah. So he was a teen and they're like, 
be a man. Just yeah, get out there and play. Play on a broken ankle for an entire basketball game. You're the star. Here's the bunch of pills. And so I married an addict, and I had no freaking clue. And I can't even tell you the drama, bankruptcy, um, infidelity, emotional trauma, you know, just on and on and on. And at the end of the day, it wasn't his fault. Yeah. No, there's yeah, he has to be accountable for his behavior, as do I. But a teen being thrown pain meds, yeah, he got addicted and his body chemistry changed and that affected his entire life. And whose fault is that? You know? Yeah. Is it the teen? Is it the teen? Do do we tell children who've been molested by a Catholic priest, which I did an interview with uh with some of the reporters on the spotlight team at the Boston Globe about, you know, that whole outbreak were those children responsible for being molested and then having substance use disorders later in life dealing with the trauma? Uh, no, <laughs> they were not. Yeah. Hmm. What about hmm. the argument for addictive behavior? Like it was just brought out of them, but it, it was dormant. You mean with um, like the Catholic priest as an example, or with? Well, no, 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 not that. I don't even want to touch that one. So <laughs> I don't even want to touch that one. But That's a whole other show. Yeah, it's a whole other show. But if you're if we're saying like for addiction or addictive behavior, like I'm addicted to working out, I'm addicted to you know something, mm. I'm addicted to whatever. It's like, well, you know, do you go and you have like again? It's probably more clinicians that are like, oh, well, this happened from age six and. You know, it's just more of you seeking attention or seeking love, ultimately, and this is why you're self-sabotaging or acting out. Like, is that explored as well, or it's more, um, I mean, is there a way to look at things preventively? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, this is my personal opinion based on what's worked for me, because I have an addictive personality. If I did not have an addictive personality or addictive tendencies, I would not be a workaholic. That's my biggest aholic. <laughs> it trumps here, here. wine, it trumps food, work. And that's where I escaped into and I turned it into something really wonderful um, you know, later in life. So do I, is it a bad thing? Hmm, you know, that's one of those, uh, again, a chicken and the egg thing, but if I'm using that analogy correctly, but um, I don't have Google in front of me to check before I things come out of my mouth. But um, <laughs> I think that, you know, we, we, <clears throat> there are some people that don't have that personality type or don't have that tendency and good for them. But I also know, and I've a world-renowned psychiatrist that's on my show every week has written a hundred books, most of them bestsellers. Dr. Paul Meyer has said people with um, substance use disorder um, and people that have bipolar disorder. He said this on many shows. Once they're leveled out in their sobriety or their medication management or whatever, are the brightest, most empathic people that do amazing, unbelievable, creative things in the world. And it's that oomph, that mm, mm, mm drive that can be labeled as addiction when you're not carefully monitoring it. It's that drive that gets gets them doing those amazing things. So... Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of uh, people say, oh, I don't want to take medication because it ruins my creativity. And what I say about that is, well, then you're not on the right medication. (laughs) (laughs) Because medication does not need to stifle your drive and your creativity. It actually can enhance those things because you're operating um, as you um, with things in balance instead of you trying to live life with a mood disorder and addiction tendencies <laughs> unassisted and trying to handle that along with how stressful life already is. Yeah. Yep. 
fondu. Any other questions, David? Uh, no, I think that. <laughs> <laughs> I figure y'all have cauliflower ear because once I get going, I can't stop talking. Clearly, I'm oh, not for not podcasting. <laughs> it's just great. I mean, as you probably know, as a podcaster, that the hour flies by. I mean, we're just like, oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. But before we let you go, mm-hmm. you, you did kind of give us that that ten thousand foot view. You had given us, you know, what had happened, you know, 20 years ago, 20 plus maybe. You showed us, you know, what's happening today. And I'd like to ask you a crystal ball question, if I may. Sure. So my my crystal ball question is, you know, there's, uh, I guess, good and bad and everything. And so there's wonders of social media. There's wonders of having all this technology and information at our fingertips. Uh, some of the bad that, that it's slowly coming out is the uh, narcissism of not of just being so sing, like you mentioned earlier singularly focused on one thing you're not having that human interaction um, right so you, I, I'm hearing a lot of a uh, social anxiety disorder and yep. I wanted to get your take as to the future of mental health in that regard well luckily I um, met an amazing young man. He was 22 when I met him. He's 23 now. And he does the podcast on our network called The Social Networking Effect. And it's all about social media and its effect on mental health. (laughs) And he's been doing this for seven years. And nobody would listen. I think I was one of the first people that went, oh my gosh, you are a freaking genius. Um, please come and be a podcaster on my network. We've got to get this information out. And uh, the, the, we're, we're seeing the effects of it now. I think one of you had mentioned, you know, in the beginning it was, oh, we're kind of like hippies. It's all peace and love and kumbaya. And now we're like, oh, right. Now we see where it's been taken uh, and we're seeing the negative impact. So my hope would be that the field would um, accept Jonathan Bertrand's um, verbiage around, you know, a social media disorder, social media usage disorder, those kinds of things. I hope that they that becomes part of the the diagnostic manual, the DSM, and that that's treated and treated well in the, you know, in the mental health community, that would be my hope. And then crystal ball, I could see that happening. And I could also see happening that people become more discerning about their social media usage. I know I have and um, use it as a tool that spreads awareness, um, advocacy, help, you know, all those things that it can be used for good. It's like the force. It can be good and it can be evil. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. the crystal ball would be, let's evolve now that we know what we're dealing with here and we know that it is actually changing the brain chemistry of people and that it is uh, doing, you know, causing more social anxiety and there's an even bigger epidemic of rampant narcissism and so on. Now that we know this, great, let's do something good with it and let's use these platforms for what they originally were intended for. I don't care what anybody says. I do not believe that Mark Zuckerberg went out. Is that his name, Mark, or is it Jeff? Mark. Okay. Jeez, edit. Anyway, um, (laughs) I should know that. But anyway, that Mr. Zuckerberg went intentionally created Facebook in order to mess with our minds. I'm sure he had some, oh, this is working. Let's, uh, maybe you didn't think totally because we just didn't have the data to know. But I'm sure he did not sit down. And I I don't, I just can't imagine that he's a diabolical psychopath that did this to infect everyone. Um, And Hopefully, you know, organizations will do the right thing in this and um, and put in steps and things like that to make it what it was originally intended to be, connection, yeah, not dis- not disconnection. Yeah, because used in the right way, it saves that. lives. Yeah, well said. Absolutely, and and that's actually a good way to end it. Um, 
Where okay. can they get more information to know about your network and, and getting in touch with you and everything you have to offer? Sure. Um, if people like to type, they can put in mentalhealthnewsradionetwork.com and that will give you a list of all of our shows, our social media, and everything. And if you don't like to type, you can go to mhnrnetwork.com and it will take you to the same place. Awesome, okay. awesome. And if you if you haven't heard of it, uh, since we we're talking about social media, um, there's a documentary called We Live in Public. Are you familiar with that? No. Please share. Yeah. What the heck is that? Yes. It, it came out in, I think, 2006, 2007. And since we know about the dot-com era, they were showing how the dot-com era predicted where we are today as far as social media and, and dopamine and endorphin True. rushes and all that. And it was just tapping into human behavior. But as a mental health person or in being in the industry, I think you would appreciate it. Yeah, I will I will watch that. I'm surprised I hadn't heard about it. I'll ask one of our other podcasters that does the Happy Brain podcast. She's all about our happy horm you know, our happy um hormones and chemicals in our brain, dopamine and oxytocin and serotonin and uh she predicted all this too. <laughs> awesome. awesome. Well, you have just been in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I am David. And Kristen, it was a pleasure. Let's definitely stay in touch. Absolutely. Thank you, gentlemen. Yes, thank you. All right. Listen to Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective on Radio Public. It's a free, easy-to-use app that helps listeners like you find and support shows like ours. When you listen to our show on Radio Public, we receive direct financial support every time you hear an episode. Experience our show and Radio Public today by listening to the show link in our episode notes, and thank you for listening. Thanks again for checking out another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homies Perspective podcast. Please check us out on our website at intrinsicmotivation.life where you can click on the speak pipe button and leave any suggestions for a future podcast that you'd like us to cover. Also check us out on our social media sites. We have a YouTube channel, Facebook page, iTunes podcast, in addition to Stitcher and Google Play, all under Intrinsic Motivation from a Homies Perspective. Check you out next time. Have a great day.